We'll talk that will be on wildfire smoke and air quality, which um, here in Colorado, it's been pretty bad. So depending on where you're coming in from, you may or may not already be feeling the sense of the smoke that's coming from the Western United States. And my name is Lorena Medina Luna, and I am an education and outreach specialist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is in Boulder, Colorado. We're coming to you tonight from our homes. And um, if you're not familiar with NCAR, it is a world leading research organization dedicated to the study of the atmosphere, the earth system and the sun. And today we're gonna have a special discussion with a scientist from Colorado State University. She's a professor, Dr. Emily Fisher. If you wanna say hi real quick. Hi everyone. And we also have an NCAR scientist, Dr. Rebecca Hornbrook, or I'll call you Becky. Hi, everyone. And we also have a PhD graduate student, Julieta Juncosa Calajorano. You wanna say hi. Hi, everyone. And we'll be talking about um, wildfires, uh, specifically also uh, field project that they were all part of, were, which is um, the Western Wildfire Experiment for Cloud Chemistry, Aerosol Absorption, and Nitrogen, which you can remember it as, we can. <laughs> um, throughout the event, you'll be able to ask questions through our Slido interface. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and scroll down your window and you'll be able to see that we have some polls and you can ask some questions there too. One of them is a word cloud that asks you, what comes to mind when you think of the word wildfires? So go ahead and put in your answers before we come to the, um, go to the panel. We'll be able to share that on our screen so you can see what's everybody thinking about this right now. Um, we will be recording this presentation and it will be available on our NCAR Explorer series page. And I do wanna give a special shout out to Florida Institute of Technology whose students are joining us today. So thank you so much. I hope um, you get to learn a lot with us. Our panelists today are Dr. Emily Fisher, Rebecca Hornbrook and Julieta Juncosa Calaro Horano. And Dr. Emily Fisher is a professor in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences in Colorado State University. Her research focuses on understanding atmospheric trace gases how wildfire smoke travels across great distances and what environmental conditions support fire seasons with large wildfires for different Western US ecoregions. In 2018, Dr. Fisher led the We Can Field Project, which was a multi-university collaborative project with 38 state-of-the-art instruments, making it the largest, most complex chemistry instrumentation payload that has ever flown on the NSF NCAR C-130 research aircraft, which you can see in this poster behind me. Dr. Becky Hornbrook is a project scientist in the Atmospheric Chemistry Observations and Modeling, or ACOM, lab at NCAR. And she is a member of the Volatile Organic Compound Measurements Group at ACOM, whose research focuses on the emissions and fate of the VOCs, or the Volatile Organic Compounds. Lots of acronyms. You'll learn a lot today, I promise. Um, Dr. Hornbrook is a member of a small team that developed and deploys the NCAR Trace Organic Gas Analyzer, which is also known as TOGA. It's a state-of-the-art airborne instrument that measures a large number of, of organic gases in the atmosphere. As a member of the TOGA team, she traveled around the world, participating in a large number of both airborne and ground-based National Science Foundation and NASA funded field projects, including in 2018 with We Can Project. PhD graduate student Julieta Juncosa Calaurano is um, also at Colorado State University and Emily Fisher is her advisor. She graduated from Universidad San Francisco de Quito, USFKQ, excuse me, in Ecuador as an environmental engineer. In 2017, she was awarded a Fulbright scholarship to study atmospheric science in a university in the United States. She received her master's in atmospheric sciences from Colorado State University and was awarded the American Geophysical Union Paros, uh, Paros Scholarship in Geophysical Instrumentation. 
She will use this award to design laboratory experiments that will minimize the uncertainties and ambient measurements of total reactive nitrogen oxides. And if you're not aware of what these are, you'll get to find out today. Um, these play an essential role in the atmosphere, influencing human health, nitrogen deposition, and climate. Um, and then I will pass it over to Dr. Emily Fisher. But before we do that, um, Dan, do we have some, uh, can you show us the word cloud? Uh, and people, what are they thinking when they think of the word wildfires? Lots of smoke in the area. I walked out yesterday and I was like, why? Um, the impact of it, worries, destruction, the breathing dangers, climate change, and drought. There's a lot going on in our world, so it'll be really neat to hear what you all have to say in this panel. Um, Dr. Emily Fisher, um, just let me know when you'd like me to present your slides, and then we can go from there. Let's do it. Go for it. I'm ready. Sounds good. Great to I be here, everybody. I'm in Fort Collins. The smoke's not terrible right this minute, <laughs> but it was, it was earlier today. All right, I'm just going to give a second for the slides to get caught up. Um, I can start, though, with the photo uh, that's right up here. This is a photo that we took of the Cameron Peak Fire. I was actually backpacking with my, uh, my kids <laughs> the day that this, this um, fire was first reported. And so we had an adventure. We had a little run out of the woods. Um, and my kids are no longer going backpacking until the fire season's over, they said. So, all right, so um, it's, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm gonna start this off and do some overview introductory material on fires just to get us all in a fire space. And uh, then I'll, I'll talk about um, the We Can campaign and then I'm gonna pass it to Becky. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so if it seems to you like fires are getting bigger or the frequency of them um, is growing, uh, you have um, a good intuition. So this is a, a time series from a nice paper by Anthony Westerling. And what it shows is that the frequency of large um, wildfires has increased basically each decade since the 1970s. And so um, basically this is, an, this is an increase in the large fires in the Western US. And so this, these, trends, these trends are real that um, you're perceiving. And this, this trend um, is equivalent to about um, 20 or so additional large fires per decade. So can you go to the next one? All right, so um, this has been in the news and, and this has been, I think, on all of our minds, those of us that live in the West, right? There's plenty of examples. Um, there's an example here from uh, the Mendocino fire that occurred in um, California at the time that was a, a record-breaking fire. Um, and the, the weekend campaign actually um, flew into that smoke. Um, it's hard you know, to ignore what's, what's been happening um, more recently on the West Coast. And so, um, yeah, so, so this, is a, this is an issue that I think is, is near and dear to uh, all our hearts. And uh, when, I, when I look at the word cloud that you all produced, <laughs> I also think of smoke, right, um, as, and as one of the main, um, main issues that, that all of us face, regardless of how close we are to, to a specific fire. So you can go to the next one. All right, so uh, you're also probably right to perceive that wildfire smoke um, is causing some, some fairly major air quality issues in the West. Um, the issues are definitely most severe in the West, though they extend nationally. So what, what's, um, what's shown here is the, oh, I can only see chat all of a sudden. All right, there we go. Oh, what happened to the slides? Where? All right, there we go. <laughs> Stay here with me. All right, so what's shown here is 2006 to 2016 summertime trends in fine particulate matter. So this is PM 2.5. These are um, aerosols that are small enough to penetrate quite deep in your lungs. And these are the trends over this time period. And so the blue is good news. The blue um, 
tells us that uh, air quality has been getting better during summer. And that's the case for most of the, the US for total PM 2.5. The trends are downward. Um, if you kind of split our record into non-smoke impacted periods and smoke impacted periods, which is what's done here, you can, you can start to see that um, we would have probably expected even better um, air quality during summer months had it not been for smoke. So if you look nationally, the air quality is um, in terms of PM 2.5 is getting better in, over this time period in summer. The exception is the Pacific Northwest and that's driven um, by increases in um, smoke um, particulate matter. The trends here are not significant because I think as, as you also know, like there's lots of interannual variability in the severity of our fire season. So for example, this is a particularly severe year in many locations, but last year wasn't nearly so bad. And so picking out trends when there's lots of variability is, is difficult. All right, you can go to the next one. All right, so we can, just to tie to what I'll talk about later, was positioned in sort of the center of the action for um, smoke. We can't, uh, Boise is, is often impacted by smoke from many different upwind states, from Washington, from Oregon, um, and from Northern California, in, a, in addition to more local wildfires in Idaho. And here's a picture here of a clear day in Boise on the top and a smoke impacted day in Boise on the bottom. And um, you can see that Boise, Boise is one of the places where um, were it not for fires, their summertime air quality would likely be improving. You can go to the next slide. So what happens when you're exposed um, to wildfire smoke? I get this question a lot. Um, so there's consistent evidence documenting associations between exposure to smoke and um, general respiratory health effects and things like um, exacerbations of asthma, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, there's um, more growing evidence of increased risk of respiratory infections, um, and there's definitely uh, increases in all-cause mortality. Uh, the evidence for um, cardiovascular effects is, is still quite mixed. There's some studies are showing um, an association with cardiovascular effects and some aren't. What's tricky about studying the health effects of wildfire smoke is um, smoke is quite transient and sometimes, not this summer for me in Fort Collins, but smoke can be tra quite transient. Sometimes, you know, the plumes um, are thin, they may not hit a monitor. And um, so it's, it's quite difficult um, to be really sure that you have the exposure right. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so there was a poll. <laughs> there was one of your poll questions about, oh, we're back on health. Go forward, there you go. All right, so there was a poll question um, about who starts fires. And I, if you haven't answered it, we're gonna show the answer pretty soon. So uh, this is your chance to do that. So this map here, um, while I talk through this, you can go find your poll. All right, so this map shows the location and ig ignition type of wildfires documented in um, a data set that's uh, called the fire program analysis fire occurrence data set and these are fires that are located um, in the u.s between the period 1992 and 2015 and they're on here there are um, 1.8 million dots um, and when you look uh, in aggregate at this um, map you can see um, two different regions we have boxed here. You can see the Western US, you can see the Southeastern US. This is not a perfect data set and you can see there's inconsistencies in reporting. You know, you see some state lines here that are just a function of reporting. But there's pretty good data for the boxes that we have here for the um, Western US and for the Southeastern US. So here you can see there's a very different um, fire starts. So in the um, if you look at the overall picture of the entire U.S., only about 15% um, is ignited by, 15% oh, of fires are ignited by lightning, and, you know, 70, um, 75 or so percent are lighted, are lit by humans, and then we don't know about the other missing percent there as it adds up to 100. 
there's very different ignition types. You can see that um, you know, humans are lighting fires closer to where humans live. <laughs> and so you can see that for California, right, there's a lot of human starts. And if you were to zoom in on this map, you could see that humans are lighting more fires closer to roads than they are away from roads. So in the West, but fire number is not, you know, not really the only thing here. Um, what, what really matters for air quality is, is burn area. And so that's what we have on the next slide. So can you scooch over all right here we go so here on the bottom axis here is this um, size of the uh, fire so and the scale here I just uh, want to give you um, some perspective on the scale here so the the Cameron Peak fire those of you who are you know color in Colorado right now or in Fort Collins the Cameron Peak fire is around 128,000 acres so that's, you know, between 10, that's a pretty big fire. That's between 10, little over 10 to the four on this scale here. So in, in terms of um, percent of total burn area um, for the Western US, um, most of our lar lightning ignited fires are um, over the time period of this study were responsible for, for most of that burn area. And so that's the answer to your, uh, to your first poll. <laughs> the large fires account for most of the burn area in the West. How did they do? Yeah, let's go ahead and see that, Dan, if you can share those results. They did pretty well, right? Am I interpreting that right? There was a large fraction that got, to, was that 24? Yeah, so 24 people. 30%, good job, 24 of you. Good guessing or good um, quick internet surfing of <laughs> the Journal of Geophysical Research. Either way, I'll take it. <laughs> Great, thank you for participating. And then I'll go ahead and share the screen again. Sounds good. I'm just waiting because it seems like it's gonna it's not flipping over there we go all right so next slide you can go to the next one all right so um smoke this may surprise some people um but smoke from large western u.s wildfires you know really does blanket the u.s during severe wildfire seasons so um air now uh now has a, a absolutely wonderful wonderful uh, interface where you can look at smoke plumes, which is what's shown in gray, and I'll talk a little bit about that data set, um, and air quality measurements, which are the, the dots here, that's the AQI, the colors are the AQI, and then you can see also fires, right? So um, the little tiny fires you can see there. So these smoke plumes, these represent um, plumes that are identified visually by analysts uh, that work with the, they're from the NOAA hazard mapping system. And the um, dots here, right, those are air quality index. And so the AQI you can think of as a yardstick. So when you're at green, green means go to my kids at least. We can play outside. There's uh, no risk from bad air. And as you go to warmer colors, as you get up to um, red and you know, even at Fort Collins, we were purple here um, a day ago. Oh, when you get to red, you start to be, um, uh, in a sort of a hazardous type condition where the general population will start to experience health effects from smoke. So this is a picture I think from the sixth um, and that I, I just pulled quickly uh, off as a screenshot and you can see that the smoke really extends over the entire uh, almost the entire U.S. Um, and if you look in aggregate at these smoke plumes, it's fascinating. The place in the U.S. where smoke plumes are most often overhead is actually the Dakotas, kind of this Midwestern area here. Here in summer, one third of the time there can be smoke overhead actually, but it's not often at the ground impacting air quality, so we don't think about it as much. Um, but yeah, they, because, because this region of the Midwest can actually be downwind of so many different fire regions depending on the transport. So both fires in, in Canada and then fires in the US, um, like now you can see in this image here, right? These smoke plumes are from Colorado and from California that are going over this region. So, so yeah, these, this really is a, a national issue when you think about it from the perspective of um, 
the, the, the whole atmosphere. All right, we can go to our next one. All right, so we can. So what is we can? So so we can um, was a, a very um, fun adventure in summer 2018. Uh, as Lorena said in the beginning, this was a collaboration amongst a, a number of large um, Western US universities, as well as NCAR. Here's my uh, awesome team. And, you know, when I'll tell you where they got these headbands from because it's kind of fun. Uh, the plane broke and they were very sad. And so I went in Boise to Joanne Fabric and I said, that's it. Let me see if I can find some polka dots. I think the team needs this. And then, you know, a day later, the, the plane was fixed and it came back and, and we carried on with our field program. So let's talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about we can. It's fun. I have a question, Emily. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to take a few questions based on what you just said? Anytime, anytime. I don't know how to see that there's questions. Yeah, so I might just come in and ask every once in a while if that's okay. Sure. Sweet. So one of the things that you talked about is the percentage of the human ignition um, of the wildfires. And one question was, does this human fire percent take into account for controlled fires? Or is it, like, what does it account for? Um, not, not, um, not the data that I showed you. That is, that is wildfires. Mm, okay. And then um, there's another question, and I think you might talk about this later, is how can we determine the smoke is fresh or aged? It <laughs> Your aged? nose does a pretty good job, yeah, actually. But, um, but uh, we can, do, and so fresh or aged can have different meetings. If they wanna um, chirp in with more about that question, then I could answer that more carefully, but, um, but the, there, the chemistry of smoke plumes can tell us um, how fresh or aged smoke is. And you can also use uh, a number of different um, meteorological models to um, figure out the likely transport time from emission to a given location. So there's multiple ways to, to do that, that attribution. And I'm assuming you guys will talk about that. That's part of what you guys did is in this field campaign. It is, it is, and um, Becky has a slide, I, yes, I think that one is in there, where um, she has things broken down by smoke age, and she can talk to you, or I can jump in there, um, and talk to you about how that, the smoke age was attributed. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. And then um, I'll, I'll ask one more question, and then maybe we can keep moving forward. I know there's a lot of questions from the audience, so thank you so much, everybody. Um, um, how much does smoke affect the climate? Does it cool the atmosphere or cause an inversion layer and trap heat underneath it? Um, that's a big question. There's lots of different ways that smoke will affect uh, the atmosphere. Um, so that is a that is a big that's a big question. So um, Smoke aerosols, so the, the particles, right, they absorb and scatter light. So there's definitely a, a radiative effect um, that smoke has on the, um, at least North America, during summer months. And um, so I don't know offhand um, globally what the magnitude of that is off the top of my head. I could probably find that for us by the end of this presentation pretty quickly. I know exactly where to look, um, but I do not know the net effect of fires compared to, um, say, other greenhouse gases, for example, off the top of my head. That's awesome. Yeah, and I feel like this is an ever arching, like ever going question that if any students are interested in continuing to pursue these questions to find answers, there are opportunities out there. Okay. So I'll go back to you and the slides and you can um, let right. us know a little bit more about WeCan. Yeah, just go to the next one. So I'll tell you a little bit about WeCan. Here we go. So WeCan was focused on really, really on chemical evolution of smoke. So, um, and we're motivated by the need for society to better predict air quality, nutrient cycles, climate and weather. And so um, 
There are three pieces to WECAN, and this dictated what flew on the plane. So the first one was fixed nitrogen emissions and evolution. Julieta will talk a little bit about that. The second one was the evolution of aerosol optical properties. That was led by Shane Murphy um, at the University of Wyoming. And then um, the third part, which was the most challenging and most fun flight planning wise, was um, a focus on cloud activation and chemistry in wildfire plumes. So we can go to the next one. So here's what we did. So um, I should stop here in a second. I will stop, but um, I am soon going to give away the answer to one of the polls <laughs> about how long these typical flights were for WeCan. So we, the C-130 aircraft was based in Boise, and that summer we visited um, many different flight fires. WeCan attempted to sample about 20 fires in a semi-Lagrangian way, which I'll show you a video of that from the front of the plane in a minute. Um, so we sampled fires throughout the Western US that summer. And um, here's a map of everywhere we went. The fires are labeled and the gray shows the flight paths. So can you go to the next slide? So here we go, let's play it. So when we would approach a fire, and this is us approaching the Kiwa fire in, in Idaho. So there's a fire. Um, you can see that burning up ahead. We would come up from behind the fire and try to capture um, really good measurements of the background air, so the air that the smoke plume was injecting into. And then we would, um, basically as soon as the pilots felt comfortable or as soon as we were away from firefighting efforts, if there was um, firefighting on the fire, this one did not have firefighting, we would turn right into the smoke plume. So there we go. And then you couldn't see anything and it smelled like a um, campfire. And then as soon as we were out back in clean air, we would turn back around and do it again. And we would basically zigzag down the plume, um, trying to cross it perpendicularly. And we would try to sample the same air mass that we sampled very close to the fire as we moved downwind. So each transect, we're trying to get a sense of how the smoke is aging with time. And so this is a, um, a fast forward of this, but we would basically stay with a fire for up to four hours and do this kind of sampling um, in a smoke plume. And I think that'll end there for you in a second, hopefully before you all get sick at your computers. Yeah, I guess I wondered, did you get sick going oh, in all these circles? Well, I'm extremely motion sensitive. So when, uh, when I um, knew that this was funded, I immediately approached some uh, more senior scientists and said, okay, um, real talk with Emily, how do I not throw up on the plane? And um, <laughs> <laughs> so I got some of those patches, those motion patches, and I had to wear them every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you like looking at my phone in the car in the passenger seat? So. <laughs> um, do you want to see what the poll results were for people who sure. answered how Let's long? They did. There you go. You hit it. Good job. Right about six hours. Yep. Wow. Good job. All right, let's go back and get to Becky because I think um, I think I'm getting close to Becky pass passing the baton to Becky. I think there you are. Go. I am. I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I feel like I passed the baton after the video to Becky. <laughs> there you go. Take it from here. <laughs> All right, I get to take over. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of what it's like to work on a project like we can. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the measurements that my group um, makes, um, my group at NCAR. So what you're looking at, this is the view from the loading ramp at the back of the C-130 during one of our weekend flights. Um, and as you can see, the cargo area is completely full of instrument racks. Um, during a flight, the area is actually pretty still. Um, I would say it's quiet, but it's actually the opposite of that. It's very, very definitely loud, um, but very still at the same time. Um, this payload is actually the most complex that our C-130 has ever supported. Um, it isn't atypical for a chemistry project to deploy a lot of instrumentation, um, but this project definitely pushed the aircraft to its, its absolute limits as far as weight and capacity were concerned. And that's actually one of the reasons that our flights were typically around six hours, seven at the most. Um, the C-130 completely empty can go a lot further if it flies higher and empty. But um, with this much payload, we, uh, it limited what we could do. Um, so if you could just click the animation for me. 
there's an arrow that will show up. Um, so that arrow points to the instrument that I work on. That's the uh, Trace Organic Gas Analyzer, or TOGA. Um, and as you can just barely see my seat tucked in behind that rack and the one that's behind. And that's where I spent the majority of the flights um, while we were doing weekend, when I wasn't at the back taking a photo like I was here. All right, so if you can click on the next. Um, I can imagine that some of you are probably wondering how we sample the air as we fly through it. Um, well, on the outside of the plane, we have many different types of intake inlets, probes and whatnot, um, both along the sides of the plane and on the belly. Um, and they're, they stick out far enough so that they can pull air in from um, the free air that we're flying through so that it's not influenced by the, uh, by the aircraft. Um, so some of the inlets will actually slow the flow of air down to limit wall losses. Um, some pull it in really, really fast so that the chemistry in the sample tubes is minimal um, and so that we have the best response times and we know exactly what we're flying through. Um, some of the systems, some of the inlets are actually optical systems that measure the properties of air um, right where they are, so without actually bringing it into the plane at all. Um, I think there's another poll that we took that we should probably um, think about soon. The one that, what's, what's the one that's left? Um, what time we usually try to, to uh, what the optimal time to sample a, a fire plume is. So if you haven't had a chance to do that one yet, we can, we can take a look at that. I'll stop in a minute, and, unless there's a question. Um, no, I think you were already talking about some of the instrumentations and that was one of the questions was what kind of instrumentation um, is up in the plane? and like what kind of chemistry is being like, done. So I think you're kind of touching upon that right now. Yeah, um, I, I can briefly um, mention that we measure a lot of things that are um, well known that come out of um, fires like carbon monoxide and um, nitrogen oxides. Um, we also measure things like water, we measure all of the state variables and um, that includes things like um, temperature and pressure and humidity and so that we have a full picture of what the atmosphere has. And then there's a lot of instruments that measure um, really complex things um, like the VOCs that we measure. Um, there's other instruments that measure VOCs. There's a lot of um, aerosol instrumentation that I know less about because I'm a gas phase person. Um, but as I said, we packed this plane to the gills. Um, we're also looking at things like light because as we fly through um, through a fire, or through the, no, we never th fly through a fire, but as we f fly through the, uh, um, the smoke, the, you've noticed it if you live in the West that sometimes the sky can get really orange and that's exactly what we see. And um, we need to be able to see how much, how much sunlight is getting into the middle of the plume so that we know what kind of chemistry is happening in there. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide now. Okay, so back inside, um, these are a few shots of our instrument team in action. Um, on the left, Nicola Blake from UC Irvine, um, who worked with the TOGA team during WeCan, is filling the NCAR, um, filling the TOGA do doer um, with liquid nitrogen, which is always a good photo op. Um, we use liquid nitrogen to cool traps in our system during flight um, so that we can actually sample things and, and trap some of the more volatile compounds. Um, in the middle, I'm sitting with my seatmate, Amy Sullivan from CSU, um, who ran a whole bunch of different systems on board. Um, and on the right, um, I'm in flight with my headset on, which as I said, it's really loud on board. So we need ear protection, but it's also so that we can communicate with the rest of the, uh, the flight crew the, and the mission scientists who spend um, most of the flight up in the cockpit. Okay, um, why don't we go to the, uh, the last poll and see what the responses were. Sounds good. And the question was, what is the best time of day to sample a smoke plume using oh, a large guys, research aircraft? You guys are very good. It's exactly 2 p.m. And the reason for that is that, well, it's between noon and 3 p.m. typically. And the reason for that is that um, although fires can actually, you know, keep turning all day long and all night long, the heating um, from the sun is what causes the fires to, um, to flare up in the daytime. And we can't sample using a large aircraft like the C-130 into valleys. And um, we need that, 
the smoke to to rise up into the uh, into the free troposphere or at least up into the upper part of the boundary layer in order for us to sample it. So 2 p.m. is about when we often would try to get on station. And um, I do have a question, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, the, one of the questions was about like, how does aged smoke influence the surface ozone? Does it have differences over urban areas and rural areas? Because I know that, you know, ozone could, could have an effect specific times of day and specific times of year, but do you, do you know much about that? Or Emily like, just popped up. It looks like Emily is going to try and tackle that one. Go for it, Emily. You want me to tackle that one or do you have a good answer that you want to give? Uh, my answer is it's complicated. Do you have a better answer? <laughs> it is so complicated, but we learned a lot about ozone during weekend and I think we will we'll learn quite a bit. What makes ozone tricky, right, is this is a secondary pollutant and there's multiple ways that a fire can contribute to ozone. So there's very rapid ozone production in some of these wildfire plumes on the time scale of like minutes very close to the fire. Then things seem to stabilize in terms of ozone relative to carbon monoxide as the plumes move downwind at constant altitude. Then the, those plumes descend um, depending on the nitrogen in the plume and what form that nitrogen is in. You can trigger some more ozone production. And then when smoke um, impacts an urban area or a place where people live, it doesn't even have to be an urban area, you can have some additional new chemistry where the smoke is bringing with it some NOx and it's bringing with it a bunch of VOCs, tons and tons of VOCs. And so depending on the local chemistry, um, the smoke will perturb the chemistry there in different ways. And so one thing that we do know is that on average, when you look across the US, when smoke comes to town, um, it, there tends to be a bump in ozone locally, um, all things held equal. Right, so at the same temperature, you know, the, if everything is the same, smoke in the mix, there tends to be more ozone on average. Wow, that was a good question, and thank you for answering that. I'll go back to the slide deck for you. All right, and I think we can go to the next slide, which is another video. Okay. So this is a time-lapse video that was taken from the front of the cabin during a weekend pre-flight. Um, and it's a little choppy, I know, but it can kind of give you an idea of how busy it is on board while everyone is preparing all of their instruments for flight. Um, usually our flight, our pre-flights are about three hours long. Um, and during that time, instrument teams um, typically have a checklist that they need to go through um, to make sure that everything on their instrument gets turned on in a particular sequence. Um, they need to get pumps spun up or chambers um, evacuated, um, replenish gases and reagents. Um, some of them are running diagnostic checks or calibrations. Um, you can see some people move around an awful lot while others are sitting in their seat just doing things on their computer the entire time. Um, also, there's some instruments on board that are autonomous, which means that they run without having an operator actually on the plane during the flight. So those scientists need to make sure that everything is ready to run on their instruments in their absence. Um, you can also see that there's a big fan at the front of the, uh, the aircraft here and a large yellow hose at the back. Um, and Boise is very hot in the summertime. And we needed to, as I said, take off sometime between noon and two in order to optimize when we arrived at fires. So um, there was a lot of effort at keeping the aircraft cool um, prior to departure. All right, you can go to the next slide. We don't need to watch again. Okay, so as I said, um, I, at, at NCAR, I work with a team that deploys TOGA, um, which measures volatile organic compounds, um, or VOCs, in the atmosphere. Our team is led by Eric Apel, and it includes myself and Dr. Alan Hills from NCAR. Um, and for the weekend deployment, we had two team members from the University of um, California, Irvine, Alex Jarnot and Nicola Blake. Um, TOGA is an online GCMS, or gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, um, which samples and analyzes air samples every two minutes or less while we're flying. Um, there are many different kinds and many different sources of VOCs in the atmosphere, including wildfires, 
um, natural emissions from vegetation and oceans, and also lots of human-caused emissions um, from things like fossil fuel use, indus um, industrial activities, solvent emissions, and so on. Um, can you go to the next slide? So TOGA actually measures about 70 different kinds of VOCs, and I know this looks really complex, and I've tried to group everything into a bunch of different kind of categories. Um, we measure non-methane hydrocarbons, things you've probably heard of like butane, benzene, toluene. Um, those are compounds that only contain carbon and hydrogen. Um, we also measure a lot of nitrogen containing compounds, which was important for um, a fire study because there's a lot of nitrogen containing um, VOCs that are emitted. Um, also things um, that contain oxygen like formaldehyde and methanol as well as a lot of more complicated ones. Um, and finally on the right hand side we've got a lot of halogenated um, VOCs and um, VOCs that contain sulfur. Some of these are emitted by fires, some of them are entirely man-made and by measuring all of them while we're flying through these um, through the, uh, the air, we're able to tease out sometimes the relative influence that fires and human activities have on the air that we are sampling. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, so these are some examples of how our data look when we're sampling the plumes. Um, you've already seen kind of how we attack a fire by going perpendicularly through the smoke and then moving on and kind of going all the way down um, further and further from the fire. Um, so these plots show three different VOCs that we measure, um, all identified as HAPs or hazardous air pollutants by the EPA. Um, they're all colored by their concentrations on a log scale with, and you can see that the highest concentrations are in the thickest parts of the plumes um, and the lower concentrations are on the edges. Um, the compound that's on the left, which is acrolein, has very low concentrations in the background air. Um, but a strong gradient um, from the wings of the plume to the center of the plume. Um, the species in the middle, formaldehyde, has less of a gradient, um, but the concentrations are still very elevated in the, in the plumes. Um, let's go to the next slide. So one of the things that we wanna see in the plumes is how the chemistry changes as we move from really close to the fire to further downwind. Um, so one of the ways that we look at VOCs is by using concentration ratios or what's called enhancement ratios in the smoke. Um, so in this example, I'm showing um, the enhancement of styrene, which is a very reactive um, hydrocarbon um, that has a lifetime that's pretty short in the atmosphere of about five hours or less um, to carbon monoxide, which is, it remains in the atmosphere for several months. Um, so by looking at the ratio of these species, which are both emitted from fires, we can um, take a look at the chemistry that's happening as we move away from the, uh, the fire, independent of the plume mixing with the clean background air. All right, next slide. So another one um, of the ways that we use the weekend data set is to explore health impacts. As, as Emily mentioned earlier, we know that there's a lot of different um, health impacts from some of the chemicals that are emitted from fires. Um, many hazardous air pollutants are known to either cause cancer or have acute or chronic health issues, um, cause acute, acute or chronic health issues. Um, so TOGA actually measures about 40 different HAPs, many of which are emitted by fires. Um, in this study that I'm showing here, Kate O'Dell, who's a PhD student at CSU, um, used TOGA data to bin wildfire smoke into three different age categories. So knowing the fact that this is kind of the answer to somebody's question earlier, um, knowing that some of the species that we look at have very short lifetimes and some are a little bit more longer lived and some are very longer lived, um, we can, we use those, um, those, um, characteristics of the VOCs that we were looking at to bin air into different categories to look at the cumulative exposures of all of these HAPs um, to people who are very, very close to the fire um, in communities that are impacted by wildfire smoke that's very fresh or a little bit more aged or a little bit older. Um, and we do have a couple of questions if that's okay to ask. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, you get a lot of data coming in um, with your instruments, but you know, you're going over terrain. So a lot of mountains, so there's some turbulence. So there's two different questions, but it's about along the same lines is, you know, how does that change the confidence of the data that you're collecting? Does that affect it much or not? 
That's a good question. Um, typically, the air that we were looking at was above the boundary layer, the really turbulent part of the boundary layer, um, which is how our pilots prefer to fly um, outside of the, uh, you know, the region where there's a lot of terrain. Um, but the, uh, the measurement, uh, as we're bringing air in, what we're really interested in is um, what is right there. So um, I we yes, do a lot of calibrations. We make sure that we are knowing what we're looking at. But um, we also, you know, if there's, if there's turbulence, if there's a lot of um, uh, updrafts, then that's something that we're interested in. And we want to measure that just as much as we want to measure the smoke itself. That's awesome. And then when you're measuring this, you're measuring a lot of the chemistry. So you're getting like little samples of the, the droplets of water from the clouds. But do you also um, measure particulate matter? Does that come into the instruments as well? Um, so the, the instruments that are meant to measure gas phase um, have curves that are actually meant, the curves in the inlet tubes that are actually meant to prevent a lot of um, aerosols from getting into our, into our systems because we want specifically to measure the gas phase. Um, but there's also a lot of instruments that measure aerosols and specifically are looking at aerosol properties. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think we've got one more slide. This is actually, I want to hand it over to Julieta now. Um, briefly though, there was a lot of students involved in Weekend. It was a great project because we had a lot of different universities involved and um, some pretty impressive um, educational components. So I'll hand it over to Julieta now. Hey y'all, can you listen to me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear oh. you. Awesome. Um, so yeah, as Becky said, um, there were um, a lot of students involved uh, during weekend and they were a huge part of, of weekend, uh, whether they were um, handling the instruments or being part of these uh, other phase of weekend, which were the educational flights. So once the um, research flights were over, um, the airplane flew back to Colorado and we had um, some flight hours dedicated to educational flights. Um, so three universities, CSU, University of uh, Wyoming and University of Montana did this um, aircraft measurement class. And the first, um, the first month of the class was uh, dedicated to teachers the strategies of planning the, the flights, um, thinking about what we would like to measure, um, what we were interested in. And um, there were a, a variety of students taking this class from people who do a lot of cloud, um, cloud research or very, uh, or meteorolo meteorology focus or uh, more uh, of a chemistry focus. So um, I think the it was very interesting to put our, all of our dea ideas together. So here I'm showing um, a picture in the top left of the third educational flight. There's Jacob putting his arms up because that is the last flight <laughs> that um, they did. Um, so there he is uh, saying this is victory, yay. <laughs> um, and here is my flight, the first educational flight, and these two are the, um, the two diagonal ones are the uh, second educational flight. Um, can we go to the next, please? Okay, so uh, as Lorena said, I am from Ecuador and I came to the United States to start my uh, graduate st studies in atmospheric science. And so day after I arrived to the US, um, Emily flew me to Boise. Um, so that I could meet the team and you know get acquainted with the with the plane with the instruments um, and just understanding what was going on because I was going to work with this data. Um, so there's a, a picture of the airplane um, and then here in the middle there's a picture of Emily and me. Um, a fun fact is that the day that I got into Boise I think that was one of the hottest days of the <laughs> of the summer and uh, that weekend we held a open house to the public so we were um, receiving people and you know touring them inside the airplane and I was in charge of taking people from the um, main building in the in the airport to the airplane and anytime 
I had the chance I would peek inside the airplane to see what was going on. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, I decided to show you how our educational flights looked like. And so this is me and Will, my um, seat partner. And in during this flight, um, Will is a, he was a PhD student at CSU and was very interested in looking at ammonia for feed, from feedlots. So he decided to do these flights around these um, feeding facilities um, from cattle and try to measure the emissions for ammonia. And so here is uh, Will, I'm sure in the, in the picture on the right, he's uh, working with the pilots to do these circles around these feedlots and then also this um, sampling down uh, downwind from these uh, feeding facilities. Um, so we sample a couple of them here and then up here. Um, uh, we during that flight we also sampled some cumulus clouds um, so we uh, were kind of attacking clouds and going through them, which was, I, I, I was in the cockpit, cockpit for that and it was pretty, pretty awesome. Can we go to the next one, please? Um, the second educational flight, um, I was actually interested on doing a, a spiral where there was going to be a satellite overpass location because that is a way to validate, validate um, satellite data that I was going to work with. Um, we couldn't fit that plan in the first educational flight where I where, where I flew, but we fitted in this second one. I, and um, I think this is the flight that most of the people got sick. So uh, I am sorry, and I am very grateful for <laughs> you doing this um, spiral. Um, this flight also sampled some air from a refinery and some um, smoke from the Red Feather Lakes fire. Um, next, please. And for me, at least, this the third educational flight is the um, prettiest one because you know I've been looking at wildfire um, smoke plumes for two years now, and I think this uh, this picture here shows a very pretty smoke plume that this um, flight got a, was able to measure. So they sample uh, smoke from the Silver Creek fire and also some um, Denver air quality. And you can see here in the picture to the left how, um, the, how the smoke plume looked from, from the airplane. Next, please. And so then back in the office when the flights are over, we need to um, look at the data and put all this data together and uh, make a nice summary out of it. So that's what I, I did for my master's. I've been thinking a lot of nitrogen chemistry in these smoke plumes and how some of the, the species that are emitted, such as car, uh, nitrogen monoxide and HONO, um, react, uh, get photolyzed and turn into other species such as nitrogen di dioxide, which then can form reservoir species for itself or can get farther oxidized and even go to the particle phase. Um, and that's what I did for my uh, masters. Um, next, please. And the super cool other thing that I did for my masters is look at satellite data, which also let us see a small chemistry, which was amazing. Like looking at this uh, data was uh, so rewarding. So this, I'm showing here the SWAMI MPP um, satellite. The, there is a instrument here that measures PAN, one of the species that I've been working with. And so this satellite is an Adir viewing satellite, which means it looks directly overhead um, of the atmosphere. And it has an amazing spatial coverage. So we actually got to see active chemistry happening um, in, in the satellite observations. Um, this satellite is on the A-train orbit track and it actually has two overpasses on the approximate same location, one at 1.30 one at p.m. and another at night at 1.30 a.m. So we looked at the afternoon data at the 1.30 p.m. because that's when most of the fires were active. Um, yeah, so I think that's me. 
And I think we have another slide which uh, promotes science a thon. Um, um, Lorena, do you want to take this one? Well, I actually have a question before we go oh, back. Yeah, you know, you were, you were showing a couple of, um, like everybody has been showing pictures of all these flight paths and it looks like you can go everywhere is what somebody is asking about. What are the constraints on that? Cause like, do you talk with the fire department and you know, all the planes that drop the fire retardant on them? Like, how does that work? Yeah, um, Emily may have a better answer for this, <laughs> but, but I know that there are a lot of constraints on um, whether there are firefighter, firefighting um, activity going around the fire or, um, you know, you cannot get too close to the fire because it may be too dangerous to fly mm -hmm. uh, close to the fire. Yeah, so for weekend, we stayed out of the temporary flight restricted area. Um, for all of the fires. Uh, if there was the option to fly a, fi a fire that was not being fought, uh, we, would, we would often make that choice because um, it just offered a bit more flexibility. Um, there, the pilots are in um, pretty constant communication. You know, we file flight plans and then we have to change them because the fires change. <laughs> so um, that's constantly sort of being negotiated. Um, when we get to the, the big fires, um, we, we need to be um, in good communication about where the plane is because you can't see. Um, so they're, the, they're not flying visually. We have a certain box that we need to stay in, a box of air um, or a certain you know, radius from one location at certain altitudes and we would operate um, in, that, in that place, in the atmosphere. And then other times, you know, the pilots would be flying visually, but actually it was such a smoky summer that that was relatively rare. Um, not zero, but like not as often as I thought it would be <laughs> because of the visibility in summer 2018. And I know that sometimes weather balloons are used for taking samples of the atmosphere, like different um, parameters of the atmosphere. So there was somebody that asked if there are any weather balloons that are being used to go through the wildfire smoke to get some of that change in the um, in the chemistry of the smoke, or I'm not sure. Maybe you can describe what we it is. Lost that air. Oh, I. Can we you can hear me. Somebody else should take it because I my internet. I. Yeah, I I think weather balloons. Um, I haven't heard of them going through a smoke specifically, but the other thing about weather balloons is that they can handle a, a specific payload, um, which can measure just like very specific um, components of the smoke. So um, maybe maybe the state parameters they can measure with weather balloons, but I don't know about the chemistry. Yeah, you know, it, Becky, it's yeah. hard to do the level of chemistry that was done um, with the small sensors at this point. There's, you know, you can measure, there's ozone sons and there's, um, but, but the level of chemistry is, is uh, power intensive and <laughs> weight intensive so. so that makes sense why you would get such a large aircraft to be able to actually fly through and get the specific things that you need mm. yeah we did have some um, ground-based activities as well though um, in addition to having another aircraft that was based in Boise at the same time as the C-130 um, there were also several um, mobile units um, making measurements you know, from the ground, um, moving up close to where the fires were, so they could actually sample throughout the day and the night, which is something that we couldn't do. They had limited payloads as well, though. Yeah, that makes sense. This has been so amazing, and you have so much still that you're working on for the data. Um, so it is uh, close to our time to end, and this is a great place to end if people would like to continue to learn more about what scientists do, and also to see what it is that a day in the life of a scientist is like. Um, there is this program called Science-a-thon. And Emily, can you talk a little bit about what, what the goals are for this, outside of you know, what I just mentioned? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can talk a little bit about it. It's fun, right? So it's a five-day social media celebration, and um, scientists, not just Earth scientists, not just atmospheric scientists, um, it's broader now. Um, all different scientists can sign up and participate and 
they will post um, either a photo an hour or a photo a day next week, depending on what their, um, their work schedules are. Uh, and yeah, you should, you should go and check it out. It, um, it was um, brought to us originally by the Earth Science Women's Network, and, um, which is a, a great organization uh, dedicated to early career uh, development for the Earth Sciences. Um, I just picked two scientists here randomly. Uh, Tracy Holloway, I know, and the other scientist I don't know, but she has a book that I just checked out for my kids. <laughs> so I said, all right, let's put her photo up. She seems awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. And are any of you participating in this um, program that we can follow, Julieta? I am going to participate, yeah. I'll be there. I still have to register, but yeah. Because they were asking me for a picture, so I'm like, oh, I don't have a super cool picture now. So, <laughs> yeah, I left the registration. Sounds good. It continued, yeah. Awesome. And I will also be participating in science -a I have my PhD in geophysics, so I might talk a little bit about my background there. I was able to go out um, on the field with Emily and the team for three days. So we have some pretty cool science videos, um, the science of WeCan, what it's like to be a uh, pilot, an engineer, a student, um, a lot of other videos. So check out our NCAR Explorer Series website, Field Campaigns page to see more of those videos. They're pretty short, about three minutes or less. Um, and I'd like to thank our panelists so much for joining us today. This was very informative and I hope that research continues to move on. I know we have a lot of questions from everybody. So thank you so much for participating um, in this. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. Great. I have cool. lots of questions about smoke too. <laughs> Sweet. And um, for everybody out there, on October 13th, there will be a lecture at 10 in the morning um, for the Walter Orr Roberts um, Distinguished Lecture. And it will also be about air quality. So check that out on um, the UCAR Cyan webpage for more information. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone.